Namaste. Welcome to Shaman's Shed. Today I am honoured to be speaking with a personal hero of mine, Benjamin Joseph Stewart. Ben is a filmmaker, producer, musician and podcast host. He is well known for documentaries such as Esoteric Agenda, DMT Quest and my personal favourite, Chimatica. He is the narrator, researcher and a producer for Gaia TV's Psychedelica, which has just released a fantastic second season. I am delighted to welcome Ben to Shaman's Shed. Yeah, so thank you for coming on Shaman's Shed. Um, yeah, firstly, can I say, you know, it is an honour to talk to you. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I sort of first encountered your, your work over 10 years ago. Um, and it was, you know, one of those sort of life-changing documentaries, which was uh, Chimatica. Um, but, you know, of course, you know, you've done, you've produced and you've researched, you know, you've narrated loads of other documentaries, such as Chimatica, es- Esoteric Agenda, um, you know, and... Gaia TV now you're doing psychedelica in the second second season of that um can I just start really by you know for the for the the audience we've got Shaman said just for you to just tell us a bit about yourself and how you came onto this path and um you know such a path of wisdom and you know so many insights and research how how did you get to this place yeah you know Man, I, I, I give this response or I respond to this question every single interview I, I do. And I seem to find new things to draw upon to answer it because um, what brought me onto this path, it, it, I always felt that um, the path brought me onto the path. Like it, it collided with my world and it just wouldn't go away. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I was, I was, an army brat early on in life, constantly traveling, you know, never in one location more than a year or two years. Um, Ended up in Kwajalein for a while, which is in the Marshall Islands um, in between, you know, Hawaii and Micronesia, these tiny, tiny speckled islands with these Marshallese Islanders. And there was a shamanic society and I was five. And that was how I really got introduced to indigenous ways. And then from there, I went to Hawaii and I got introduced to, um, you know, the Hawaiian culture, but also the, um, the racism. They, they hate, they, at the time, they really hated white people. They've become a lot more accustomed to us now, call us howlies. Um, but we were constantly getting beat up and, and um, picked on in school. And my teacher hated me. So there was a lot of like the world I can't say it didn't make sense to me, but I realized as I kept traveling and I experienced different cultures that the world is, is a vast place and is very dynamic. And I I wanted to know more. So as we really started kind of just settling down into living in Connecticut and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, I, I lost a friend on the same day that I broke my ankle and I was real big into sports and I was a running back for this football team and I broke my ankle and that was just the end of my sports and the very beginning of me getting into music. So then I became this musician. Uh, I got into my very first band. We, you know, it was throughout high school. I freaked out because then the whole money thing getting out of high school I was like, man, if I, if I become a musician or an artist, I have to continue to make stuff people like. And, you know, that's the, and what if they don't like it anymore? And I'm living in a cardboard box, right? You know, we go to these extremes in our minds. So I decided to go into the military and I did for six years, I was in the military, but while I was there, I, I um, got into another band as the singer songwriter within the first year we were on Lollapalooza with Jane's Addiction, Audio Slave, A Perfect Circle, Incubus, um, Kings of Leon, 30 seconds to Mars, Jurassic five, just an incredible lineup. And that really showed me like, no, Ben, you got to go for it. You got to go for what you really want. And all the while, like, you know, through high school, I got into psychedelics, whereas everyone else was getting into opiates. And I noticed that, like, I noticed in me that psychedelics does this. And it seemed like everybody else doing the opiates, psychedelics did that to consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was part of it. And then eventually when I finally got out of the military, I was able to start coming out and saying what I wanted to say about the world. Cause when you're in the military, you can't, you, you represent the military, even when you're in civilian clothing. So that was when I made my first film, Esoteric Agenda. 
And I just decided to go for it. I said everything that I thought about the world at that time. And that is the moment that it really like, it was like when I spoke my truth clearly without any reservation, um, but I, I wasn't intentionally trying to jab or call certain people the wrong people and other people the right people, other than certain elites. And I, I eventually got off that whole kick of pointing too many fingers. That was when opportunities to travel around the world in conscious circles started opening up for me. So then I finally got an opportunity to go down to South America, to Peru and do ayahuasca. And this was the first time that I'd ever done psychedelics in a ceremonial setting. And when I did it, it totally, it launched me into a new understanding of psychedelics. They amplify what is. So if you're in a bad spot, they'll amplify it. If you're at a death metal concert, they'll amplify it. And that doesn't mean that's bad. But for the most part, when you're hypersensitive, the last thing you want is really heavy, fast paced in, you know, in your face music. Um, you want something that'll calm you down because you realize that the mind actually thinks quicker when everything else is slowed. It's almost like the flow state. Yeah. Things seem effortless. You move faster when you go a little slower. Um, so anyway, long story short, the path found me even before then. But the path, I think music was what really started launching me into it because it gave me a way to use my voice. And then when I started mixing doing film work with my music. And then I was able to, to get more on the nose, like what do I really think is going on in the world? Then the other people who feel the same way, who felt like, oh man, you're speaking my language, dude, like this film changed my life. That added pressure to me, but in a good way. It made me realize like, I have a responsibility. Like if, if people are telling me, you know, cause some people be after esoteric agenda, they left their job. Some, you know, this, this one guy left his family and I had to coach him back, like, go back to your kids, go back to your wife, ask for forgiveness, beg for forgiveness and say, I, I'm, I'm having a weird transformation. I don't understand it, but you know, I know that, you know, like the family is important is key. So I had to start coaching people because of ideas that they got from my films. So that launched me into being a coach, working one-on-one. -on -one. And then eventually it's just, I'm an artist. So more than a filmmaker, more than a musician, I'm an artist. I love creating. I love speaking my voice and expressing myself through different mediums in ways that make you really have to wonder like, ah, I, I get what he's saying, but he did it in this way. You know, that became my spiritual path, not just getting up there and preaching about how other people should live their lives. I always felt that that never worked inspiring people which is the job of an artist inspiring people is not forcing them out of fear or coercion or manipulation to live in a better way you call them to see that that's actually what they want and then they'll just they'll just follow on that path if that's what they want and so that's you know long and the short of it that's what launched me into being an artist and really i found that my mode of expression in art is very much so informed by the spiritual journeys, the, the mind expanding experiences that I've had and the, the knowing that it's not all about having the craziest, wildest experiences and past that, you know, like, so you could tell other people, you just don't know where I'm coming from. You haven't had the experiences I've had. Mm. It's, it's this, I'm here to serve. I'm here for you. I also understand I don't know everything. So I, that relieves me from having to be perfect. And I get to just be me and discover myself. And in that process, other people get to see, oh man, I don't have to be perfect. I just have to walk on this path. And that's when I just decided, no, this is my path. I'm gonna stop trying to you know, step off of it and find something else that may suit me more. Those are all just tangents. This is the way, so. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's interesting that you say that, you know, you, you're looking to, you know, it's your path and you are in service rather than necessarily having, all, you know, the necessary experiences and things. And I think sometimes that can be this, you know, what's great about multiplicity is that everyone brings those experiences together. But I mean, something that really hit sort of home for me in, from Chimatica, for example, is, you know, you really dig deep into the, the idea of this sort of ego consciousness 
um, that has, you know, it's like essentially, you know, a disease that a parasite that's taken over consciousness and it's, you know, dominating the world. It's a frequency that we're sort of stuck in. Um, and that really resonated with me. And I, when you wake up from that, it's quite traumatic to suddenly realize what a, for me personally, what, how egotistical and this false mask that you're wearing that he thinks you and isn't you, it's quite a traumatic experience. And I just wondered, did, you know, as part of your, journey was there any of your own sort of ego you know awakening was there some sort of traumatic event that you made you go whoa okay that's my that's my ego vibration that you know you hadn't noticed or was it something that you just were aware of from day one you know you know I, I I feel that um when I was younger there were some things that like you know when I when I'm being real pragmatic about it I was just a kid um, but there's a lot of things I did when I was younger that um, I held on to a lot of guilt, you know, ways that I didn't even realize that I hurt people, you know, emotionally, I, I never, you know, I never beat people up or anything like that. It was, it was really just ways of being. And, you know, there's, it's strange when we hold a ton of guilt. Um, and let me just speak for me, not we, um, when I held all that guilt, I knew I had this inner knowing that like, it doesn't matter how other people are being, it really doesn't. If I don't have my center, there, there's no reason to blame others. And this was the, the core of Chimatica was, you know, esoteric agenda. I tried to end on that note, but then I realized two hours of conspiracy pointing out all the crap in the world. And then 15 minutes at the end saying, you know, like, but we are we are part of the projection we are part of what is being projected into the world people were like man i love that film but could you do an entire film like that last 15 minutes the more upbeat part how we have the responsibility and i was like yeah yeah and that became chimatica so i think that over the years acknowledging that how deeply these things that weren't terrible, terrible, terrible things that I did when I was younger, they weighed on me so much. There was so much gravity to them. And that was one thing that like, you could call that selfish. I didn't want that gravity. I didn't want that weight. It, I realized that it really, it turned me into a person that I didn't like. I started getting snappy or irritable, not because of the stuff outside of me, but because I was in a space when somebody would come up and just ask a harmless question, I would be in a space of self-judgment. And I would be like, I don't have time for this, that kind of energy. And come to realize that like, if I don't resolve that within me, I'm of no good and I'm of no service to people outside me. So that was when I realized like, man, there really is no other way. There's no other path other than to work on myself because I'm not the one that's out there, you know, um, working on oil rigs and, you know, my energy and hourly on the clock time is being put towards stuff that's going to dump oil into the oceans. I'm not doing those types of things. So it's really the way I am around people that needed polishing. Um, but I would say that Plant medicines definitely, they, you know, they 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 show you yourself. They really do. They they get you face to face with things that you've done that you didn't even realize hit people in a different way. You said something and you thought you were completely justified, and you're like, yeah, well, if they don't like it, then they they need to stop being a baby about it. And then you're like, in plant medicine, you're faced with that's what you said with your, with your mouth. Do you realize what you said with your heart, with your body language? Mm -hmm. And then I got to feel how it felt being spoken to like that. I got to feel how it felt. You know, I'm a parent now and I, I see all these little things when, you know, when my, my three children, one of them's doing something I don't like and I get my head really close to them. Right. That's intimidating to them, you know, just body language wise. Mm -hmm. And like, for me, that's to get them to listen, but I don't realize on the receiving end, that's just like, what's he about to do? Hmm. And like, I'd, I'd never lay a hand on my child, but like body language, you see a dog bare their teeth. You don't need to have training. Like a child, a little, you know, child that doesn't even speak, doesn't need training to know that's when you start backing up from a dog. Yeah. Yeah. So, so those little tiny things is when I started realizing like, oh, you know what? 
the real path is in the nuances. I know we think it's all the big stuff in the world. And, that, and I used to be like, like pointing out and pointing fingers at the, the 1% and the ones who make the most money, the ones who make the biggest decisions until I started realizing, and this isn't making excuses for anybody or anything, but even the 1% are at the whim largely of the 99% and what we will accept. Now, mainstream media, they have their ways of what um, Noam Chomsky called manufacturing consent. Yeah. They can't do anything without our consent, but they can sure, you know, cause us to say yes, like, you know, hem in, you know, our options and be like, well, the only option is go back and you don't want to do that or go forward and accept what we're, what we're saying. You got to mm -hmm. give up your freedoms, but here's, here's your privilege, your new privilege now. That stuff definitely happens, but for the most part, it's also not as organized because we, for the most part, aren't as clever as we think we are. And we are magicians. I've come to realize that we all do actually create our own reality, but we don't realize we're doing it. So we blame others for when it comes to, to pass, the what we've manifested comes to pass and we don't like it. We look for who's to blame. And the ego, the last person the ego is going to allow us to point the finger at is ourselves until you make that a habit. And it's not a blaming thing, but it's always like a good idea. If you're looking for somebody to blame and that's the energy, start with yourself first every single time and then start working on the word blame. It's just where was the process of what came to pass triggered and how could you do something better in that moment instead of waiting for other people to do it? Because I really do feel that when we start being the change, it's louder, like a whisper is louder than a scream. A scream makes you close down and shut it off. A whisper makes you lean in and be like, wait, what is that? What's, what am I hearing? So you get into the nuances more. And it's the same when you just be a certain way. Because you ever notice like you, you, you go to family events and everyone's chaotic and talking. And then there's that, you know, grandpa sitting in the corner, just smoking a pipe looking at everybody man he looks so content mm -hmm. he's just yeah. you know sitting there enjoying family and it's just like what is it what's that guy's secret right everyone else is being loud and that's the one the one quiet person in the room just you can tell like man they're happy with life how do i get to that point that's that's how powerful and you know how much gravity the subtle things are in life so chimatica that's what i was trying to focus on was I know you think the, the path and the way is to become an activist and point the fingers at the problems, but really start with the small, but the number one thing you have control over is your actions. Other people, you can tell them to, to stop cutting down trees, but that doesn't mean they change. That doesn't mean they're enlightened, right? So that's kind of what I was getting at is like, the change needs to become viral. And, uh, you know, there's something you mentioned there, which really sort of resonates again, you know, you mentioned about um, the subtleties and the nuances and, you know, I, I've experienced this again, all around that same period. It was all within the year, a very almost magical year. And like, even when you use the word, your, your language you're using now, it, it makes it, 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 it doesn't do it justice to how magical those subtle things are you know mm -hmm. for example like you say the guy sitting in the corner smoking his pipe and he's content you know I, I came I sort of experienced I met a swami while I was you know on this sort of I, at the time I was seeking him out and you know found him and was sort of getting his information on Vedanta and stuff but the first time I met him he was he was he was meditating and there was I'd never felt vibration before. I'd never noticed it. I'd, it was, I was completely ignorant to those things and to feel someone else's subtle energy, it almost, and it puts you in a relaxed state that, I mean, that was, that was what I got from the guy. And that was the first time I'd ever noticed these sort of things. So what you're describing, it's that it's very subtle. They can either be very subtle, or if you can, if you look for it, it can be completely, it can be magical. It can be, you know, whatever your conscious makes of it so you know i completely understand you know what you're saying there um, you know what's kind of cool is there's a, another big part of my work is focusing on practical 
easy to understand, uh, like freely available and very applicable tools to understand those subtleties and those nuances, to feel them. And um, right now, I can't go into too much detail, but I'm working on a project about darkroom retreats. Okay. And first thing I did was like, okay, where, where, how far back in history and across the globe can you find darkness traditions? And I already knew about the Maya. I already knew about the Kogi in Colombia. The Kogi in Colombia, in the mountains of Northern Colombia, they would hand select initiates, children, and they would be born in complete darkness. And for the first nine years of their formative lives, they were in complete darkness. And so I'm just going to leave that there for right now. They were called mamus, and they're higher than a shaman. They're a high priest, and they are guides for the entire world, even though they don't speak to the world. They once did a BBC documentary, and that was it. Then they told, leave us alone forever. Um, and then you go to the Maya. The Maya, well, you know, initiates would go into caves, and there would be like a, a bat god in there, almost like Batman, right? But with a sword to sever your head, you know? And these are things Manly Palmer Hall did a lot of work on showing. Um, you, the Druids, potentially Newgrange was a site exactly like this. Thousands of years ago, where you would go in, you'd be in complete darkness for a while, and then you'd reemerge. The cult of Mithras had the Mithraeum. The Eleusinian mysteries had the Telestrion. All those Mithraeum actually became Christian crypts underneath their churches. And then Christianity, uh, some Christian Christians actually started using them for dark retreats around Easter time. And so then you have the, um, in the Dzogchen tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, you have in Mount Kailash and, and uh, other ca caverns in there, You'll actually have people at 20,000 foot elevation inside a cave with very little oxygen, food, and water doing two years in darkness, right? And, and I could go on and on. Egyptian caverns beneath the, you know, the, the, uh, the king's chamber and beneath the uh, pyramids, um, on and on and on. In India, it goes way back. But the point is, I just had it in here is this thing called the mindfold, and it just completely blocks out all light. And I've been wearing it the past few nights to microdose this darkness. And I realized that an hour before going to bed, I like just testing out how well do I know my room, you know? So I'll put it on and I'll have to like get around in, you know, complete darkness for me. But then I sense the light. I know when the lights are on, even though this is completely blocking out the lights. And I know that skin and stuff like that is cytophylactic. We receive sunlight through our skin but I could sense it. So I started diving deep, man, these traditions go way, way, way back in history. And then now in the nineties, there was this guy, Ananda Bozeman, and he is the one who trained Mantak Chia, who is a big Taoist uh, guy out in Thailand. He's taken people into uh, cave retreats in the darkness for like nine days. But Ananda was taking people into like for 16, 20 days at times into the darkness and what he would find, which I completely understand just from having experimented for a while um, with these goggles and other things in darkness is the pineal gland starts to be able to see when the eyes can't and the darkness is not dark. After a while, it's so filled with color yeah. and mental stuff that it is not dark at all. In fact, it's, it's very pregnant with different things, but you begin to external meditations. You're, you're going into REM while you're awake and you are walking around inside your dream. So you've externalized it into the dark. And that to me was incredible. And uh, Ananda was saying like, your pineal gland can perceive um, UV and infrared light as well as sound waves and translate it to the prefrontal cortex as visual um stimuli even though like it's it's back here in the occipital lobe you're not seeing back there it's actually translating up here so it's just i mean the very interesting thing about like you experiment with darkness and then you can start sensing light and he was saying we need to start taking this into underground ca caverns we can't mm -hmm. just black out the windows because you can hear the radiation of the sun 
and it's super loud it roars yeah. and so he's like you after a while you can start seeing your nervous system you can reprogram your subconscious mind but and if you see a chair the chair is really there but archetypally you're going to see every single chair you've ever seen <laughs> yeah. because you're tapping into the archetype of chair yeah. and that is how the pineal gland sees so just by putting on a mindfold for a couple hours a night, I'm able to start tapping into that. And there's other ways where when you're in there, you don't have to be in there for, I mean, there was a woman in Japan who did 60 years in the dark with brief little interludes out in the light. And they say that it's another thing for longevity. It, it increases DH, DHEA to youthful levels and wrinkles start going away, yeah. hair, uh, gray hair starts turning back to its original color, um, skin tone starts coming back, vitality starts coming back. It's incredible. So what does this actually mean? It means that we have tools to solve problems that we're looking for the science institutions to solve for us with medical, pharmaceutical, or other kinds of interventions. So we've turned the outside world into our nanny state into our perpetual parent we don't know how to do it ourselves even though the answers are swimming around us we're not being the scientists ourselves to touch that subtle energy that you were talking about that that swami was just emitting and so belief is the one thing that's cutting us off the most and that's why i did this show on gaia called limitless it's all about our human potential in the very first episode i was talking about impossibility walls where Roger Bannister, who broke the four minute mile, mm. before that doctors were like, it's impossible. Now everyone listens to doctors and, and it was like, your knees would you know, collapse, your, your lungs would collapse, your heart would explode, it's impossible. And then Roger Bannister does it. And then the previous guy who came closest was like, well, I wanna do it. Three months later, he does it. Mm. Three years later, hundreds of people, including teenagers are doing it. So where was the, where was the wall? Was it physiological or was it in our belief? Because now people are doing it all the time. You look at skateboarders, 13 year olds are landing tricks that Tony Hawk couldn't do in his late twenties, yeah. right? So this is the interesting thing about it is when we start to dare to believe more, you the act of believing, it is connected, maybe not perfectly. It's like groping around in the dark, but you can do it. Yeah. When you believe it, the act of believing it gets the body to start opening up what I believe are ancestral genetics and unpacking them and bringing them back out of their dormant sleep. And so when that starts happening, we become to not just consider a novel superhuman potential that we have, we start to remember our ancestral potential, which may be leaps and bounds far higher than where we're at today. So that to me, it also, it gets me off of the psychedelics kick because I've, I've been talking about psychedelics for however long and people mm -hmm. are like, oh man, you really seem to, you know, believe in psychedelics. I'm like, yeah, I do. But really it's only as a window. Like I believe in Roger Bannister was important as a window into a world of possibility for hundreds now, thousands of people. Not that if Roger Bannister wouldn't have done it, it wouldn't have come along somehow, but that like psychedelics are very reliable in their ways of showing you, you're just looking at the world with, while fixated on certain patterns. But I can look at an open room and be like, I'm going to take a look at all the right angles. Okay, that's one pattern. Now I'm going to look at all the green. That's another pattern. Now all the red, that's another pattern. Now separate all the men from the women. That's another pattern. And in this finite space, this is Terrence McKenna talking, you can find infinite amount of patterns only limited by your ability to conceptualize what another pattern might be. So there's infinite possibility right here. And if you show people the only thing that may be blocking us from the life we want to live is our creative artistic ability to conceptualize that it's possible. Because if we just mm -hmm. conceptualize it's possible, then reality and what we know, uh, th this other pattern of reality, which exists now in its potential form, starts to link itself up in their own, you know, almost like neurons linking, linking themselves up. So 
I mean, I know I kind of like wandered off a little bit, but like, this is really what I focus on the most is getting people to acknowledge we are far more than we've ever given ourselves credit for. And it's not just some fancy trick like, oh, well, Ben's telling us to run faster, jump higher. No, our higher potential is not individual. It's not for the ego. Our highest potential is the planet and is all the people on it itself and possibly beyond that. But it's it's too convoluted to go beyond that at present. Now it's like we need community. We really need to start finding the others to start doing things in a large scale, what we know should be happening on the planet. But we're all just like, well, who's going to make the first move? There's so much to sort of unpack there. There's so many little resonant things that you put in there. Like, for example, obviously you're talking about the darkness exercise. Uh, Again, in that 10 year period, I was talking to you about of my own personal ego journey. You know, one of the things that I was looking in was sort of practicing at the time was at nighttime with a blindfold on and looking at practicing uh, qigong and tai chi but you know very basic i i by no i don't profess, profess to be a sort of a, an expert on anything but i had a very basic book but i was doing these very basic exercises in darkness um, with no television i'd got rid of my television so sort of no outside frequencies interrupting me and stuff um and you know what you're talking about is different vibration feeling different vibrations that not aren't just coming in they do they've obviously always been there I've just never put my attention on them um and things change and you know standing on your head looking at the world differently and trying to understand that your perception you know really breaking down guarding your gates of perception we sort of used to call it to you know what your belief systems as you were saying you know you if you believe that you know you can do the impossible then it's not impossible and you know but also on the same side, the belief systems that you've got instilled in the, you prevent you from doing certain things, or you think that that, you know, you're going to fall off that chair if you stand on it on one leg. If you have those beliefs, then that, you know, they will become real and changing the way you look at every single thing and pulling it apart and spending hours doing it can, can completely sort of change your mindset. So, you know, in that sense, I, you know, I really resonate, you know, with what you're saying. Um, and also something that you, sort of going right back to the you were, you were when you were saying initially about you know esoteric agenda and you said it sort of you thought it ended maybe too negatively and climatica moved into that sort of positive direction that that ties really into something sort of really important i wanted to ask you and you know you touched on it a little bit but you know ov- obviously among these circles you know we talk about sort of controlling <laughs> forces which dictate our lives you know keep the wealth and conspire um, but when you put this into sort of the context of the self, um, how do we form sort of a better understanding? Is this force, is it just a part of our own illusory sort of ego consciousness? And it's just ourselves doing it to ourselves on a macrocosmic scale, you know, or is it an external force that is, needs to be fought and dealt with? And, you know, particularly, you know, some of the stuff you said in, you know, in that climatica now are so much, they're almost pro- you know, they haven't gone away. They're, they're, they're more sort of prevalent than ever. So, you know, mm. what's your take on it? Is it is it an external thing or is it just part of us? It's... You know, I really do come from the school of thought that it is all one thing. Mm. And I, I believe that no matter what, that's nearly the perfect way to conceptualize it because even if there were somehow something outside of the oneness that we're contending with, um, what I do feel is that coming from the perception, it's like putting on goggles and these goggles give you a certain perception. And when you have the perception of it's all me, what I believe happens is you get into more of a creativity mode rather than a fear mode. Because when it's something else, it it brings up these primal programs that I might be conquered. This is something that is not for my, the, the best of me. And in the oneness, even in the Tao Te Ching, which I, I follow a lot, 
um, it, it basically says that like anything we try to wrap language around or try to wrap even our intellects around is, is going to spoil the actuality of what it is. And for me, I kind of feel like the only caveat to that is understanding that, understanding that when this is all oneness, everything that we could say, the 1%, um, what we would call obstacles like the, the failing ecology, the, la the diminishing of biodiversity. I was just watching the David Attenborough um, documentary on Netflix that, you know, has like this chart going through his life, but it's showing you, you know, it's 1932, there's 3.2 billion people on yeah. the earth and 66%, you know, wildlife covering yeah. the, and then it's just, you see humanity's going up and all of their life is going down. Yeah. And it's easy to, to take a look at that and, and feel like there's an enemy here. There's something that is, that is causing this extinction event. And it's, it's also, it's very easy for somebody to just hop on the other side, which feels kind of nihilist. That's just like, oh, well, if we destroy ourselves, it's just the lesson that we're meant to learn. Yeah. And, and that also seems to be a way of like sloughing off any responsibility that I have to do anything in this world. And so I do feel that what's interesting is if it's all one, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for perceiving some of these things as other. Meaning like what an Aikido master does is if there is a big person beating up a little person, the Aikido master will step in. It's not like the Aikido master is like, it is like this is all perfect. It's just perfect the way it is. The Aikido master will step in because he or she sees this is, you know, this is something that I can bring goodness into and I can resolve unnecessary suffering. But I'm not going to step in with my Jean-Claude Van Damme and roundhouse kick the guy to the ground. That harm doesn't need to happen. If I'm trained enough, I should be able to neutralize harm. So think of a lion attacking a turtle. Turtle is not a dangerous animal, but, you know, has the perfect defense against the lion. Just retreat into the shell until the lion gets bored. And I've seen this happen in videos before. Lion just walks away at the end of the day. No harm, no foul to the lion. No harm, no foul to the, uh, other than wasting the turtle's time, right? You know, yeah. but like, it's probably a very valuable lesson. Yeah. I don't know. But so I guess the path that I am consistently on is... All the things we could say there's a problem with in the world, which in my waking infinity news, I'm pointing out things like the Great Reset, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, where technology is headed. Um, uh, and I can go into all those things and show it's not all just bad. There's just, they're very convoluted. They're very complex. It'll probably be good for some people on a spectrum and very terrible for other people. Um, but the bottom line of it is, can we look at it like an artist, not like, what do I do? Fight, flee, or freeze, right? That, that's, that's very like, you know, it seems like you have limited amount of options there. As the artist, one who's going to playfully engage, not fearfully engage, but playfully, there's a whole spectrum of things you can do. An artist opens up the palette of all cre creative possibilities. And the main thing to do in those moments is where is the lesson? Because behind my fear, behind what I call the enemy, behind what I call the obstacle is the lesson. So how do I engage with it? Not retreat, not pretend like it's not there because we do enough of that. How do I go directly into the belly of what I find to be scary, the problem, the enemy, with the awareness that I'm not going to find some Hollywood version of, um, of like an arch nemesis. There will be a lesson there. And that lesson will come with consequences for sure, but there will be a lesson there. And that lesson is what allows for me to unfold my spiritual path yeah. along the path of life. Because, and I'll just end with this. There are a lot of people that I feel they get too, they become too much of the activist. They, they want to act but they don't want to sit and reflect. They're not into contemplation. They think that's way that they think it's wasting time, but the ones who are all about acting, 
you you tease it apart and i do this in my coaching you tease apart like what's the worst case scenario okay and then if that happens what's the worst case scenario if that happens what's the worst case scenario and sometimes if death is always the worst case scenario then it's like okay what's the second to worst case scenario so you can really get at the nuances of where is the fear stemming from and for the most part it's usually expectation life shouldn't be this way mm-hmm. there shouldn't be class disparity there shouldn't be homelessness. There shouldn't be hunger. There shouldn't be sex trafficking, child trafficking. And believe me, I get it. I'm not saying there should be, but when we have a laundry list of all these expectations of what life should be, we are making it harder and harder and harder to feel like we are free. And without freedom, we feel like it's slavery and the ego will be like, well, who's to blame? Start pointing them fingers, start finding those people that are to blame. And we love finding the people that are, that are the hardest to touch. And this is the reason why I've had to really embrace the conspiracy crowd, not just because I touched on conspiracies, but because I noticed the same thing in me that I notice is the main obstacle to people's conscious expansion yeah. is, yeah, but what are you going to do about it? I mean, look at Bill Gates or look at the Rothschilds or look at, you know, the, the 1%. It's always the 1%. And mm-hmm. it's just like, when that's the only thing you focus on, you can't do anything about it on step one. That's like, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Well, you got to digest it at the end. Yeah, but you you missed the other parts, eating the elephant, actually going through the process of putting all of that in your body. And we're already focused on being done digesting it. So the problem with many of us, especially the ones who are looking for someone outside of ourselves to blame, which the only action that can emerge from that is either name calling or doing something insidious that does start to tend to look like terrorism or acts of terrorism or thwarting the greater machine that's moving. Or we start realizing, how do I render that obsolete? by doing what I know needs to be done, like growing food, bringing the community together, being who I know I need to be, living in that equanimity. So that's that's the, the main piece that I wanted to point out there is we have a lot of expectations of what life should be like. And when we have those expectations, we can either be like Braveheart, unwaveringly, I'm going to champion this cause, I'll die before I stop championing this cause. And sometimes you realize, yeah, but you didn't have to. You could have sat there and maybe contemplated your path for a while and realized, okay, I can either charge headfirst and dive off this cliff for a noble cause, or I can contemplate and see that there's actually steps walking me down there. And now, you know, I, I wasted 20 minutes contemplating and now I'm alive at the bottom of that chasm, not dead for a noble cause. You see what I mean? Yeah. This is where a lot of activists I feel go wrong is they get a little information and they act this much. Whereas those who contemplate and at least include contemplative exercises like meditation, Tai Chi, these things of really rooting yourself in who am I being right now? With that little bit extra time, it it really does cause for us to have a lot more resource and information and every action is 5,000 times more efficient than all that action that the activist is doing. That's at least my humble take. Yeah. And, you know, you, you touched on something really key again there, this sort of internal sort of locus control, you know, giving away, you know, blaming other people. Um, and it, it, it ties really well into something you, you mentioned a bit earlier with regards to, you know, with the plant medicines and, you know, and, you know, big sort of pharmaceutical corporations sort of disempower people they take the your internal you know locus of control away they make you feel powerless i don't know how to heal myself i can't do that i'll just get the prescribed magic pill and that will heal me mm-hmm. um and i you know you you're the serious psychedelic you know you look at plant medicines and shamanism and ritual they seem to be sort of re-emerging in in the in the you know the collective consciousness, I think, even in, you know, that sort of archetypal figure that turned up at the elections, even though it wasn't necessarily the correct archetype, it was, it was there. It was in, con- it was in consciousness in some form. And I just wonder your take on this in terms of, 
the, the state of the world at the moment and this global sort of trauma we've got at the moment, once again, going back to Chimatica, you highlighted the same thing. I think you referenced, you know, Wilhelm Reich and mentioned, you know, that sort of psychic disease of the mind, you know, and I wonder if this is relates now this disempowerment, you know, there's this virus, this, you know, this, this problem with the world and the only way that it can be dealt with and cured is if some external force helps you and it vaccinates you or, you know, whatever it, you know, is that kind of what you're talking about is that this, this sort of, whether it's part of us or whether it's external, there's this force is continually trying to take the power away from us when really, you know, we can heal ourselves. That's what these plant medicines do. They make you, you know, they're not a magic pill. They make you look at your problems and your traumas and your, you know, your, what you're doing wrong to your, your friends or your family or animals. They make you look at those things and take you through that. Is that kind of where we're at? Is that how you look at how you look at things now? Is that what you meant? Yeah, for sure. You know, what's happening in the world right now, um, the, the easiest thing to do would really be to just take it at face value. And I think the artist, what I love about the artist is the artist never just takes it at face value. They tease apart the nuances on purpose. It's easy to just say, um, you know, the world is so messed up. People are never going to learn. Or, you know, most people don't want to wake up, you know, like it's, it's, it's easy to get disempowered with that kind of talk. But when you're actively looking for the lesson and you're trying to acknowledge that there is beauty lurking behind this ugliness. And when it comes to, you know, like, like I won't get the vaccine, you know, if you can even call it that, because, you know, there, there's many saying it's, it's not a traditional vaccine, yeah. but I won't even go into that, um, into that direction. For me, I stand by what I believe. I, I try not to get super preachy, but I say what I believe so others may hear it and consider the, the manner of thinking. And I could have gone on a huge tirade about the, the medical industry and you know the educational system and all these institutions of what humans have done with it. But I, I also feel like I agree with some parts of what you would call institutionalizing, having large scale access to education, to, you know, um, to healthcare and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's so rudimentary right now. It's not functional the way we know it could be. And a lot of the times we take a look at the systems and we say, you know, it's easy to be like, to take a look at the people who've implemented a system, we take a look at all the problems that have happened with it, and we say it's their fault that there's however many deaths due to opiates every single year. Okay, that's a fair statement, but let's let's find the nuances in there. Do I have to say yes to an opiate if I am a patient? Is it only the doctor's responsibility? to help us find the point where we should no longer be on opiates. So we're not chronically on opiates for the rest of our lives. Is it only their responsibility? Is there something in us that needs to acknowledge, and I'm just going on the opiate thing. Is there something in, this, in us that needs to acknowledge, okay, at the end of the day, somebody's selling me something. It could either be a drug dealer on the street or a doctor in a white lab coat somebody is selling me something, I'm paying for it literally, either through an insurance company or with cash on the street. But I'm putting it in my mouth. I choose when, I choose how much, and I, I choose how often and for how long. And we don't like looking at that. So if I were to make a film, not about the medical industry, but about um, in a sense, like I'm trying to find the, the proper ways because there are many people that uh, are dealing with this problem. So I'm trying to find the proper language of it. But if I were to make a film saying that, you know, no, it's actually the people's fault. If you should just, you know, just look at it that way, it's actually just the people's fault because we're making the decision. Then that's insensitive on the other side because there is some culpability with the system that it's illegal to go out and buy drugs on the street, right? And it's highly encouraged. It makes it so easy. 
So we're getting closer and closer to the truth where at the end of the day, it's always up to us. It's always our choice. And we do have the right, even if there's a cop in our door saying, you have to let me in, being like, uh, like, absolutely, absolutely not. I don't have to let you in. I know my rights. And sometimes it doesn't end correctly in those situations. But we have to exercise what we know we have to exercise, just like in a difficult conversation. If we have to call somebody out, but we're not into confrontation, but we know that we should call this person out on something because it's their blind spot and they're harming themselves, then you got to kind of call it out. So you have to stand for that. And if you stand for that, that's actually you enlivening who you came here on this earth to be. So when I look at what's happening in the world, like with the pandemic, with the vaccine rollout and the talk of vaccine passports and everything like that, I had to give all that context to say, I do feel like it's perfect. And I do feel like that it is a teacher, but I also completely know that so many people, I would say the vast majority of people, they're not even equipped to be able to see it that way. There's so much legwork to get mm. into before they can even conceptualize it. Yeah. So it's so difficult for them to see that this is a lesson in disguise of a fearful, you know, governmental action that you have to actually, for me, what I've done with my Waking Infinity show is I have to actually show I hear you. So I'm going to talk about the Great Reset. I'm going to talk about the vaccine passports. I'm going to talk about all these things. I'm going to show you that I've I, I dove into all the nuances that you may be aware of, maybe even more nuances than you're aware of. It's a real thing. This is life. There's real things at stake. You get that vaccine, there's real things at stake. You get behind the, you know, the wheel of a car, there's real things at stake. It's not like this is just some lesson and all lessons are just going to be just as peachy. There's real things at stake. So that's the nuance of Yes, it's a lesson, but we can't take it too lightly. When I do my movement training and, you know, my, my coach, Rafe Kelly, he does parkour in nature and he'll take a line on the ground and then he'll go five feet ahead and make another line in the ground. So stand on this line and jump onto that line. Easy, right? Now go up into this tree, stand on this branch and jump onto that branch. 15 foot drop. All of a sudden, it's not so easy anymore because we acknowledge there's real things at stake. And that fear can cause me to actually not land the jump correctly because uh, my body shut down with fear and I, I, I still fell, <laughs> but I didn't make the jump. Yeah. And so that's the nuance that I have to say. What's happening in the world has real things at stake, our lives, our health, our body. But this is where the Tao comes in and this is where the paradox comes in. This is where I believe the artist is the most powerful. We need to find a way to rise to the occasion of high stakes. This is really happening in the world. These things are really in motion. They're not just illusions. And it's not just like the Illuminati is, is just here for our awakening. And all of a sudden, once we all realize it was all us to begin with, the confetti comes out and the balloons go up and we all just party. That's not what it's going to be like. It's not going to be some glorious end of a Hollywood movie kind of, um, you know, epiphany at the end. Yeah. We're still going to have to see there's other people suffering in the mire and in the mud. And so I always look at it, the path of the Bodhisattva, if you're familiar. Absolutely. Yeah. The Bodhisattva has arrived at Nirvana, but is not a Nirvani. Nirvani potentially just, stays in nirvana, finds a way to stay in their equanimity, their equilibrium. The bodhisattva says, yes, but there's suffering going on in the world. I must enter myself back as medicine into the places that are suffering so I can do something, so I can serve the world. And for me, the highest path of an artist is the same as the highest path for a shaman, the same as the highest path for a spiritual adept, it's all arriving at this, our trans, the real transhuman agenda isn't purely technological, us becoming cyborgs. The real transhuman agenda is us realizing we are a super organism called humanity and that there are other organisms, I believe, insectoid, 
other kinds of creatures on this planet that most people don't even know about, maybe living underground, um, maybe, you know, in military bases. I absolutely believe there is so much more on this planet than most people gives it credit for. But to stay in the lane of our own spiritual development and how to apply it in the world, we have to look at this as this is a real stakes, um, not game, but uh, obstacle course to engage in. And we need to engage in this problem like we would a rock climbing wall, not shitting our pants, but realizing I can, I have to be diligent, but I can. Yeah, absolutely. And something that you, you know, you mentioned there, again, I almost think sometimes can't even be put into words. And, you know, you mentioned about the idea that, that you know, one of, one of the things when you said about the, you know, the, when the cop comes to your door, you know, you do have the power. The, the, they don't, they can't, cut, they cannot come in. Almost like the vampire, you know, if you don't let them in, they're not going to come in. What, there's such subtle subtlety in what you're talking about there. Again, it's very similar to what you we were saying about the guy sat in the corner with the pipe who's content and the guru. This is, it's not something, it's not like a regular materialistic pattern that occurs. It's a, it's a very subtle energy. If you are on a, a relaxed sort of way about you that you don't believe this person is, you say the cops coming in, they're mm -hmm. not coming in because there's almost like a persuasion about you. There's like a, can, that, that's, you know, you're sort of in, but you're not resistant to that person. You're in harmony with them. It's just, it's, it's almost hard to describe. Mm -hmm. but the guy that like you say even though your sovereign right is that you know you don't have to let these people in if you subconsciously really sort of think what well, that's that's not really true the law is the law and they're coming in and you don't hold that energetic vibration about you and that sort of they can see that fear in you they sense that fear in you and they come in and I think that's so important to it's it's such a hard lesson that I don't really know if it can be really taught is it something that has to be learned i don't know or meditated upon or found in, in in all the various different methods you talk about it but you know i could really hear what you were saying there and it's it's something that's so hard to you know you can explain that in one one breath to someone and they'll they'll take that in a completely different way they'll take that as a you know they can't come in just know that they can't come in and you'll be standing at the door going you, you're not you know you're not coming in no way yeah. they'll come in because it's not ingrained in you it's not part of your flow and your energy um so I, I think that's something that's really important and i have no idea how you would articulate that to to people but perhaps it's well, not that's, something that's that's a really good point um that was actually the main point of the film ungrip um so i i i could have gone to a lot of different people to talk about admiralty law and legally our rights when interfacing with a cop with a judge um, with government in general. Um, I chose Rob, Rob and the Page family. I chose him specifically because he realized it's not some game of a cop coming up and saying, can I see your driver's license and being like, I don't have to show you anything because the energy of it is you're, you're instantly kind of antagonizing them, poking them, like saying, I know more than you, you know, but they won't see it as such. They'll see like another, you know, another person that's just like anti-authority. And so they go into there, I need to protect against anti-authority because it's my job. I have to see your driver's license. So he decided to take, you know, like go into the courtroom and it's like, good evening, your honor. You know, and whenever the judge says like, so are you Robert Ernest Paget? And he says, no, I'm not that name. Well, who are you? Well, I'm this flesh and blood you see before you. And they get annoyed by that stuff. And yeah. so instead of, instead of, again, just not seeing that they're getting annoyed and keep triggering that, that you know, sensitive spot, you say like, listen, I understand what you're asking me. But what I'm saying is that name represents a legal fiction. I don't represent that legal fiction. I, this flesh and blood, only represent this flesh and blood right here. If you want to talk to that Robert Ernest Paget, he's right there on that page because that's the only place he exists, that and other documents. So explaining it clearly and having the, the forum while somebody is irate in front of you 
is quite difficult. There's a subtle nuance to that. So you definitely write. And this is where, I guess, just to put it succinctly, this is the lesson in life. There's no memo from God saying, this is what you can expect in life. And if you ever have any problems, if anyone denies you that, you come to me and I'll take care of it. We got to find our own way. And so in no way, shape or form do I say it's easy. And I, I, I try not to give that. Um, it's not even easy for me. Now, I've had moments where I've gotten pulled over for seemingly no reason. And the entire way up, the cop was coming up and I was like, okay, then you're not going to show me your license. You're going to stay in your heart, but you're not going to give them any documentation. And as soon as the cop came up and knocked on the door, I was like, good evening. And I instantly felt this shift. I was like, good evening, officer. He was like, you realize you have a taillight out? And I was like, oh, no. He was like, all right, well, um, I'm not going to give you any warning or anything like that. And he just let me go, right? And maybe that was because of me, but maybe I was overthinking it. And in a way, it's even though I know all this stuff, I was shitting my pants. I didn't know what to do. I, I was just like, what's going to happen if I like, so what if I did instantly, you know, what if he asked for my license first? And I was like, no, you know, it could have been an easy encounter and then it wasn't, but that would have been my lesson. So uh, I guess the bottom line, again, trying to stay succinct is we all have to walk our own path and on that path, maybe just keep in mind, be kind to one another and acknowledge that even though other people are, are in their lane, they're, they're, they have tunnel vision, the cop is trying to be a cop, but that cop also has emotions. You can trigger that cop and they're not all going to, you know, you know, inflict bodily harm on you, but they, most of them do go home to their kids and their, their wife and, you know, hug and kiss and they're good people. So acknowledging that be kind to other people. And before you make, how should I say it? Before you make a move that you can't take back, really, really, really check in with your heart. Is this the only way? Is it the only way that you can go? There's no real solid answer to that, unfortunately. And that at the end of the day is something that all your listeners, myself, all of us have to face is if you just take advice from somebody else and employ it into your day, you'll realize it doesn't turn out like the person said it would, you know, unless somebody says, take this amount of mushrooms and in three hours, this is probably going to be happening to you. You can pretty much rely on that's going to be happening to you, but all the other nuances like set and setting, that could be an amazing right experience or it could be a terrible experience and it all it all goes in the same way we all need to figure this path out for ourselves and the only other caveat to that is be good to one another be good to yourself in the way you talk about yourself and to yourself and to others yeah Absolutely. And something I really wanted to ask you really now, sort of really in strong relation to, um, you know, the your Gaia TV series with, you know, Psychedelica and now the new second season. Um, often people sort of describe when they, you know, use ayahuasca or San Pedro or peyote or mushrooms, you know, I, I've used all of those now and I've encountered these things. People experience you know, entities or beings um, that sometimes they can educate or empower or even create fear. You know, you touched on it a little bit earlier about amplifying how you're feeling. Um, but what's your take on these beings? Are they just archetypal parts of the self that we are sort of reassembling and integrating? And, you know, they're different frequencies that we're already just not accessing. Or are they real separate beings, gods, aliens, interdimensional beings? How do you view it? What's your personal sort of look at it? <clears throat> at the top, it's all one. It's all yeah. one thing. And, you know, um, you could say that there are archetypal parts of the one mind, but they may not be archetypal parts of Ben Stewart's mind. So, the i'll say something really quick to add um to this like the gnostics believe that our energy and our thought forms can disembody meaning that if they're like satan does satan really exist 
Well, in some respect, it absolutely does because so many people believe in it. Remember that thing about belief. Yeah. So we hold the charge for its reality in, in, di- in a disembodied form on some level. And this is why I think there are specific demons. And these are ones that over time we could get possessed by because in a sense, like we are all capable, we all have core genetics in us that um, remembers certain ways of our being that we could tap into. And not all of them are what we would call bright or enlightened or, um, you know, good in a sense. And on top of this, I think it was Iona and Alan Miller, uh, after the work of Peter Gaiaev, uh, a Russian scientist who was the one who found the D- phantom DNA experiment, which is basically you put DNA inside a vacuum tube, you shoot laser uh, irradiated ions into it, um, and those um, um, uh, photons, I'm sorry, and those photons align themselves to the helical structure of the DNA. Then you remove the DNA, you remove the glass beaker, the vacuum tube, everything else. And then you just look at that spot in space in space, and you see those photons are stuck in place, three-dimensionally stuck in place in an empty room for up to a month. Now, imagine the Swami that you were around who was meditating, having this palpable energy around him, emitting that out into the field. It's the same as, you know, a a grandma dies at home, right, in her bed peacefully. And for months you go in there, it's like, man, I swear I can still feel grandma. I can still feel her here. In a way, you likely can. And I won't go into how DNA has micro wormholes in it. And in quantum physics, Iona and Alan Miller, several really well-renowned scientists say, The only way to describe what we're seeing here is information must be being pulled from other parts or other times of uh, reality through these micro wormholes in the DNA. So there's there's something about that. Now imagine DMT beings. (laughs) Could they possibly be, ayahuasca has been done, psychedelics have been done for 50, 60, 70,000 years at least. So people encounter their own shadow way back then. And it's the same thing many people archetypally start to experience. And through the years, that archetype, so much energy and having witnessed it like this, I see you. And when you see something, you you give credence to its form and its identity. I think some of these insectoid beings or the um, clockwork elves and stuff like that, um, the, the, the goddess of ayahuasca, um, all these kinds of archetypal things, these in, huge insectoid beings and things like that, I think they do have some kind of realness to them. And I believe that what psychedelics do, we know it destabilizes the default mode network, which means we start to see uninhibited because our ego will inhibit ways that we see and patterns that we see. But phew, we just blast ourselves open. Now we're seeing many different patterns and we can't control how fast it comes to us or how much of it comes to us. So we just see uninhibited, like Aldous Huxley opening the doors of perception. And perhaps we're seeing these disembodied energetic forms that came from the minds and the emotional input of our ancestors. So I think that's a real avenue to look at. Scientifically, we're not there yet, um, but man, in Imperial College London, um, the guy who funded DMT Quest, the documentary that I just recently put out, also funded extended state DMT, meaning putting people on a UV drip for extended periods of time, meaning continuous infusion of DMT. So most DMT trips are like 15 minutes long and you're like, whoa, that was insane. And what, But you're just back. You're just back here and you're like, what was that? <laughs> Imagine keeping somebody in that state for a full 15 16 hours they catch their bearings they're in it the you know it's not so new anymore and then all of a sudden they they can talk to these beings and figure out how to talk to them how do i come back 
to this world with more information from them. So I think it's right around the corner. And I'm really excited mm -hmm. about the next 10 years of what technology and our just ambitions to know more about consciousness in science is going to start bridging the, uh, you know, that gap, I think. Yeah. So yeah. It's hard to know what those beings are, though. Yeah, um, that you know, that's so, you know, important what you said there about when you think of all the all the sort of uh, people's you know testimonies of ayahuasca and things like that, and there's so many bad ones and had bad experiences or bad trips and bad, and when you put it into perspective and you're like, we, it's a, it's not a very long time to be there, and you're just it's like being thrown in the deep end of a swimming pool as a five year old, you know, you don't know what's going on, you don't know what this new you know density is you don't know what's you know you're just dipping your toes and people get scared and run away and say you know it's demonic or it's aliens or it's this and but in reality like you say spending time and getting grounded there and allowing your consciousness to adjust and be like right okay i'm going to work this out now like a child would as it's growing up you know it's it, it's so mm. interesting it's something that's not been it's not spoken about enough and it's not uh, yeah it's, it's really as interesting. our expectations imagine a dog Right. You know, we see all these movies of like, you know, there's this dog and who's like so grumpy, you would bite people and everything. And then eventually it finds the right owner. And there's this troubled relationship where the dog doesn't trust the owner, but eventually the dog ends up trusting the owner and the what the dog wishes it could be not on guard, not on alert, not being attacked. Right. And we don't understand the dog's past. So somebody gets bit by the dog, put that dog down like you know, like, I get it, but we don't understand what brought it to there. So we're like, that's a bad dog. It's a dog that needs to die. So when we see our demons, we may not even realize, like, you know, the movie um, Lord of the Rings, Gollum, they, they, they make them look kind of creepy and you don't want to like them. But then you start by the end, you kind of feel for them because you know what happened to them. Yeah. And, you know, like, man, that this is a suffering creature. So a lot of the times we don't know what these demons are and we, we're very quick to just find an enemy and shut ourselves off forever from it. Yeah. And that is the core program of the ego. Don't look behind that curtain. Don't interact with these people. Don't do these things because bad stuff will happen. And we label it as bad, but we, we don't label it as like a challenge with a lesson will happen it's not that that dog won't bite you it's not that you don't have to like be careful around that angry dog you have to earn its trust through real steps of peeling back its armor but that takes a, a whole different kind of approach yeah. you have to at least see it as such before you even care to try yeah. reaching you know and so that's what i think psychedelics are a lot about is we get a window, but we're not stuck there forever. We get a window to face our demons. And then we get, get to take a break from it. And then we can come back. And some people are like, I always experience and I witness the same fears over and over and over again. And it's just, it won't go away. And it's been two years. And it took them 40 years to develop that kind of an ego and that kind of, you know, a, a core fear pattern. And in two years, they're like, why do I have to keep going over and over this? It's going to take some time. We, again, that expectation thing, we don't know what healing needs to look like, but we don't need to know all the nuances. I guess here's the, the main core. Why I like contemplative exercises is because it gets you in touch with the one true intelligence that does know. So what, who and what will know if it's the right time to take a psychedelic journey that one true thing that you get in touch with in mm. meditation but you really have to get in touch with it yeah who or what will know if it's the right time to say this thing that might trigger this person but they need to hear it only the heart you know like it, it always comes back to that and that's why those contemplative exercises is just like the intellect loves being like scientific and really nuanced and figuring out the formula and like, yes, it's perfect. <laughs> Real life never plays itself out like that. Yeah. But you don't need to know all those things. That's why like you can have a perfectly beautiful, kind, compassionate creature who's never read a book in their life. Yeah. And then another person who's read just about every book being a complete asshole 
yeah. terrible to people, terrible to their family, inflicting trauma nonstop, even on an institutional or, you know, like, you know, industry wide level. Yeah. So we don't really know, but something inside us does. That's why I would say always look for that which knows and it's inside. Yeah. And I always find these things, are, they're not in your control. They, these, I, these things always happen to me. I, you know, I sort of briefly experienced what, you know, sort of the dentist would call cities, but at no point did I ever have control over it. At no point was I thinking I'm a psychic or I'm I just it very subtly happened over like a period of maybe six months. And then it never, it's never come back. I've, you know, I've wanted it to and things like that. And I've, sometimes I would, up, I would up my pranyamic practices and, you know, my focusing on the Arjuna structure and things like that. But in reality, the lesson that I learned from that was that it's not in your control. It, it happens to you and the signs happen to you. And it's wonderful when they do happen to you. And it's humbling when you just accept that you're not in control of it. And that, you know, and it's, it, it it, it wanes it goes up and down because sometimes sort of the ego kicks back in and thinks that it was something special that I did and that you know but it's not it's in reality it's nothing to do with you it's like you say it's to do with that you know the, the you know you, you know your heart and that inner knowing and you know the collective consciousness that, that, that is doing those things rather than our individual sort of egos um could you just for our obviously the new season is coming out now um for the sort of people that are on here that maybe haven't seen it or seen the first season, what can I expect from the, you know, from the new, the new one um, without giving it away or give, you know, going into too much detail. Yeah. So um, psychedelica season one, really it touched on so many different topics. Um, the, the new season is really, it's heavily focusing on the intelligence of plants. And it's also taking a look at things like, what do plants help get us in touch with? And um, we're looking at the whole plant kingdom, obviously mostly psychedelics, but also looking at the whole thing as, you know, a symbiotic organism, the plant kingdom. And then we take a look at things that in the ecosystem that suffer because of our decision to throw up all these cell towers, all these houses, um, all this biodiversity that's waning. So we take a look at those things on a psychological level a little bit. Um, and we, we also focus on, we do one more episode on cannabis and just there's so much about cannabis and hemp that um, we, we're barely even talking about um, like the psychoactive effects of it. We talk a little bit about the history of it, but a lot of it is just saying like, did you realize that like graphene is, super expensive, but hemp graphene is um, a fraction of the price and far less polluting. You know, hemp Crete is an incredible way, you know, like that this plant has so much more to offer. So we're getting into the nuances in this uh, season about different things like that. We have, even have Rashad Evans, who is a ex UFC fighter. Oh. Uh, he was on um, Joe Rogan podcast saying that after his fighting career, started taking um, like psilocybin journeys and 5-MeO DMT. And it really just opened him up to healing from the trauma of his past and help heal other people. So in this season, we're really, we're really diving into like, what, what is the best way to understand what these plants have in store for humanity? Also, where is it heading in the future? Because we do talk about how psychedelics are being very popularized these days. Mm. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, I think that's, you know, we've covered quite a lot then. Um, you know, I really appreciate you, you know, talking to me and taking the time to, to impart some of your, you know, years of, you know, research and wisdom um, and insights. Um, yeah. for, people, for, for people that haven't um, come across your work before, um, obviously I've seen you, your website and things where, where do they need to go? Where, where should they head to find your work and watch climatic, for example, or esoteric agenda? Yeah. Ben Joseph Uh, and you go there. Um, basically you can find my waking infinity news, which is on YouTube. And if you just want to go directly there, it's YouTube, uh, dot com backslash by chance or fate. And I have my waking infinity news 
channel there. And then I always do a deeper dive, which is um, you got to become a member on benjosephstewart.com to access the deeper dives, mainly because I can't say a lot of this stuff on yeah. YouTube um, lately due to cancel culture. But it's actually, you know, I have to have massive gratitude for that because it caused me to really get serious on the website and start organizing a structure where people who really care to take these deep dives, um, practical ways of accessing higher consciousness, it's right there. So benjosephstewart.com is probably the best way. And all the links are available there for all of my social media. You scroll down to the bottom of the page. Um, my coaching, uh, you know, as much as I'm not doing that much coaching lately, but it's available there on the website. And um, pretty much everything is there, benjosephstewart.com. So I would just direct people over there and say, you know, find our Discord chat. We're getting big community conversations going around a lot of the stuff that I, um, topics that I get into in Waking Infinity News and what we've talked about today. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's been, you know, brilliant. It's been a fantastic talk. I've really enjoyed it. I think I probably had a thousand more questions to ask you as well, but um, <laughs> it's it. Do another one. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I would love to have you back again. And um, yeah. So thank you so much. Yeah, man. My pleasure.